can do that. He can handle Melbourne uh, Park centre court. Lars Graf from Sweden is our umpire, one of the full-time officials employed by the ATP Tour. It's nice to see that increasing cooperation between the ATP officials and the ITF officials. Look to me as if Chang won the spin. We shall discover later whether he chose to serve, receive, because uh, looked to me as if Henman chose ends. Michael Chang, 24 years of age, from Hoboken in New Jersey, now living in Henderson, Nevada. And Tim Henman, born in Western on the Green in Oxfordshire, now living in Chiswick in West London. Well, having the chance to uh, see a little bit of uh, Tim Henman this week, uh, I've been very, very impressed with his serving. He's served very, very well, very powerful, got a high percentage of first serves in. Well, that's one of the things he's going to have to do in this particular match. He's going to have to serve well. And I, I would tend to think that he's going to have to take the attack to Chang. Uh, not necessarily serve and volley all the time, not necessarily chip and charge any serves, you know, return a serves, but he's gonna, I think he's gonna have to go up to the net, work his way up to the net, and make Chang play the passing shots, and make Chang do the scrambling. If that's what Chang wants to do, and of course he does want to do that, he absolutely loves that. Uh, but, but Henman can't make the mistake of just staying back and just hitting forehands and backhands. No, I'd uh, agree with that, and I think Henman would. He was certainly talking in his press conference after beating the Frenchman Guillaume Raux in the last round that he felt that he would have to try to, and that he could, dictate the play to Chang. Chang, of course, the supreme counterpuncher. It's a risky strategy, but I don't think there's a lot of profit in Henman uh, trying to slug this one out from the baseline. Michael is playing in his first uh, official tournament of the year. He played in the exhibition event in Kuyong, just a few miles away from here in Melbourne. Last week and won it, the Colonial Classic. Chalking up some uh, good wins there over Boris Becker and Pete Sampras. But his uh, official record is played two and won two, the first two rounds here. He beat Chris Goosens, the Belgian, 6 love, 6-3, six, 6-1. Six, and then his fellow American, Richie Renneberg, 6-3, 7-5, Tim Henman, on the other hand, has the best record on the official circuit this year so far. He's won more matches as we look at uh, Carl Chang, who is uh, Michael's brother and coach, and that's uh, Carl's wife on uh, his left, our right. Henman has played 12 matches on the tour so far this year, and of course has won 11 of them. One loss to Jim Courier in three sets in the final of the Qatar Open in Doha, then winning his first ATP Tour title in Sydney, beating Carlos Moyer, who's certainly one of the flavours of the tournament this week after his wins over Boris Becker and Patrick McEnroe, and also beating Goran Ivanisevic in the semi-final. So Henman has beaten Ivanisevic, who's ranked three in the world, of course, at Wimbledon last year. As we look at uh, the, the Henman camp, those are his parents, David and Jane, in the centre there, and uh, that's his physical trainer, Steve Green, a former athlete on his mother's left. Nice gesture from Tim. His Christmas present to his parents was the, the, the flights down to Australia. They'd never been to the Australian Open before, and they arrived in Melbourne last Saturday morning, discovered Tim was in the final in Sydney, promptly hopped on the plane for the comparatively short journey down to Sydney, and saw him win his first title, and that was a, a terrific moment for them. Henman's won more money than anybody else on the official circuit so far this year. 97,100. 75 US dollars. Two minutes, gentlemen. Two minutes. But in terms of experience, there may not be a lot between them in terms of age, just two and a half years, but in terms of experience, the gulf is vast. Chang, 26 career titles. One of them a Grand Slam, the runner-up in three more Grand Slams. Henman, of course, just that one career win in Sydney last week, and his best Grand Slam result quarter-finalist at Wimbledon last year. He's the first British player to reach the third round of the Australian Open since Jeremy Bates in 1989. Jeremy that year lost to Pat Cash and the, the best British performance in the Australian Open in the Open era 
Open tennis beginning in 1968 was when John Lloyd reached the final and lost in five sets to Vetus Gerolitis, a match he really ought to have won because Vetus was cramping up badly towards the end of the match. How important is this match in Tim Henman's career? I mean, is it Michael more important, less important than a quarterfinal at Wimbledon, Bob? You know, that's very difficult to say because a quarterfinal of Wimbledon is, <laughs> I mean, that's the quarterfinal of Wimbledon. I mean, that's the tournament. But this is definitely one of the, the biggest matches of his young life. And the nice thing about or the difference between these two players, in my opinion, is that I am not sure that Michael Chang hasn't reached his peak. Uh, it's a very high peak, believe me. But Tim Henman still has yet to reach his peak. So irrespective to what happens in this match, one has to assume that a couple of years down the road, maybe sooner, hopefully sooner, Tim Henman will be better than Michael Chang. Now, if that's the case, and Michael Chang is number two in the world. Where does that put Tim Henman? Maybe number one in the world. And wouldn't that be good? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a little good. I'm, I confess that before the year started, I thought Time. if Henman could stay in the top 20, in the top 30 this year, he ended last year ranked 29, and then sort of consolidate and move forward perhaps in 1998, that would be a good effort. And yet, here we are, he's achieved in the first two weeks of the year, all his goals for the year, get to his first final, win his first title, crack the top 20. Well, the problem with him having done that is... A little bit back and forth, and, um, you know, I think that, uh, I mean, that, that was, you know, really a, a pretty important part of the match, you know, be able to, to get back in there and, and, uh, and fight and win that second set. So, um, you know, overall it was, uh, you know, a very tough match still, and, um, um, yeah, just, uh, you know, pretty pleased to get through. It's disappointing. It's, it's always disappointing to lose, but uh, it's probably more disappointing in the manner that I lost... Uh, I played a poor match, I think it's as simple as that. I'll look back on this match because I think I can learn from it. I, uh, I'll get over the disappointment quickly, but I still think uh, it, will be, it will be something that uh, I, can, I can learn from so that if it does happen again on a big court against a good player and I'm playing poorly, I can try and, try and fight my way or play my way out of it because today I wasn't capable of that. No, he wasn't. A frank admission there from Henman that he wasn't happy with the way he played. He had his moments particularly in the second set, but he wasn't good enough to beat Michael Chang. Coming up next, a battle between former French Open champion Sergi Bruguera and the new top Swede, Thomas Enquist. Huge forehand is Enquist's principal weapon. And that was a bullet. Nine, eight. Enquist. Disappointment on the face of Bruguera, just chipping the return long. Another set point for Enquist. Again, the big forehand, and Enquist had the first set, winning a thrilling tiebreak by 10 points to 8.
So the Swedes who always come down to Australia in force, something to celebrate. Bruguera, something to worry about. Break point down, opening game of the second set. Game Enquist. And a little clench fist for Thomas Enquist. Feeling now he was moving into the ascendancy. Well, four of the problems for Bruguera. Now 3-1 down, and yet again break point down. So Enquist mounting a charge. Two breaks and a 4-1 lead for the Swede. 22 years of age, ranked number nine. It was as if uh, Bruguera's personal tank was a little empty. Also, we thought the very next game, Thomas Enquist serving at 30-40. Yes, the sun at this time of day is pretty tricky. Game, game, game. And the double fall, almost predictable. Leads four games to two. So one of the breaks of serve recovered. Bruguera would uh, go on to hold serve, watched by Mike Morrissey in the umpire's chair. And in the very next game, Enquist in danger of squandering his second break. Game again. So an extraordinary turnaround. Enquist had been 4-1 up with two breaks and it had all melted away in next to no time. 4-0. From there, it moved on to five all. <laughs> it's no wonder that uh, poster advertising the host broadcasters. Australia's Channel 7 got on the screen. Well, then Bruguera's turn to be in trouble on serve at five all, 15-40. Terrific play from Enquist. But worries for the Swede. Bill Norris, the ATP Tour trainer, onto the court. The Swede complaining of shoulder problems. Yes, he had to uh, pull out of the Grand Slam Cup with an injury following his heroics in the Davis Cup final that didn't quite bring victory for Sweden. So worrying times for the Swedish fans, but Enquist Able to continue, serving for two sets to love. And clinching it with another super grand stroke. 7-6 the first set, 7-5 the second. Now then, would Bruguera still have the stomach for the fight? Opening game of the third set. And break point to the Swede at 30-40. Game oh. First game of the third set. So now things really looking good for Thomas Enquist. The only real worry, the shoulder problems. He moved 4-2 in front and threatened to get yet another break of the Bruguera serve. Not much of an approach, was it, from Bruguera? And Enquist, 5-2 up, two breaks up. And surely he wouldn't let his man off the hook a second time. Really a, a slow motion approach, asking for trouble, and it got it. And in the next game, Enquist at match point.
So Thomas Enquist had recorded his first win seven, six, against seven, five, Sergi Bruguera. Six, and the Swedes have a new hero to follow as Thomas Enquist moved in to the last 16. But who would he play in the fourth round? Would it be Marcelo Rios of Chile? The exciting 21-year-old, seeded number nine, ranked number 11. Or the Austrian, Gilbert Schaller, age 27, ranked 96. He'd never before won a match at the Australian Open in three previous attempts. But it was Schaller who played really well in the first set. Super play from Gilbert Schaller and play like that enabled him to take that opening set six games to four. Well, the second set went to a tie break, but at 6 2 up in it, the Chilean with four set points looked home and dry. Once it all went, and we wondered whether Marcelo Rios had turned the corner, but Gilbert Schaller is a determined fighter. Plenty of uh, South American support for the man from Santiago. Well, in the third set, Rios really starting to get on top. This is Schaller serving, 1-5 down. And the attempted lob, hopelessly short. And that scoreline meant it was set point for Marcelo Rios to take a two sets to one lead. set that one from uh, Marcelo Rios six games to one in no time at all first two sets had taken an hour and a half the third set some 20 minutes and Rios despite having his right thigh heavily bandaged was equally dominant in the fourth set he took that one by six games to one as well. So from a set down, Rios had really turned the match around. He, he was beaten and beaten soundly by Michael Chang. Who knows, perhaps this time Chang will make it all the way to the final and win his second Grand Slam title. Chang was through. I hope you've enjoyed day five of the Ford Australian Open from all the tennis team here at Eurosport. A very good night as we hand you over to Sports Centre to Carlton Kirby. And after that, it'll be Steve Holdsworth with some top-class boxing. Good night.